I want to talk to you today about the perverse uh, union of the Trinity. Um, going through these different arguments with people and, and things and, and uh, going over well, what does the Bible say, what is the traditions, what are they trying to put in and add to Scripture and whatever else, uh, I've heard this argument used um, by people that profess to be King James Bible believing Christians and they'll try to explain how there's three separate people within this Trinity thing, uh, totally separate people, you know, and each have their own body, soul, and spirit, body, soul, spirit, body, soul, spirit. And you say, okay, well then how can three separate people be one? All right? And they'll say, well, it's, see, it's very similar to the way a man and a woman are married, and yet they're one flesh. And, you know, I, first time I heard that argument, I thought, well, that's one of the dumbest things that you could possibly say. Because a marriage is a man and a woman. And it's two. The Godhead is three and it's all masculine. So how can you use this thing? And they say, well, yeah, it's not quite perfect. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it kind of proves what we... doesn't prove anything. Um, but looking into this thing, I discovered something a lot deeper. Or rather, I should say the Lord showed me something a lot deeper. And I, I said to my wife, I said, uh, you know, we got to talking about this whole subject and, and things. And and I said, you know, I wonder if there's a Catholic, the, the Trinity's completely Roman Catholic. And uh, they said, oh, no, it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. You have to add six words to Scripture to prove it. Um, but, you know, I, I was saying to my wife, I said, I wonder if there's an actual Catholic origin for this weird comparing the Godhead to a man and a woman being married. I said, I wonder if that comes from Roman Catholicism. And what we discovered, uh, she actually ended up finding some things in the in these two catechisms here, which I'll be showing. Um, but what we discovered, or like I said, well, what the Lord showed us, is the fact that uh, there's something very, very deep and very sinister to this teaching of father and son, and there's a union there, all right? I'm going to show it to you today. I'm going to show you the proof. I'm going to show it from the catechism, and I'm also going to show it to you. I have video proof of some very shocking things. Uh, I think you're going to be quite appalled, as I have been as I've been going through this. Um, but it says here in the catechism, this is the New St. Joseph Baltimore Catechism. Uh, this is one, this is number one, edition number one right down there. I'll show all this in just a minute. It says, The Holy Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son. Hmm. Interesting. And we'll, we'll show more about this later on. Let me just show you here real quickly. There you have number one, edition number one. And I'll get to the page here. There you have highlighted in orange. Okay. Hmm, interesting. Let me put this in a place of prominence. There we go. It's about where it belongs. Here we have the New St. Joseph Baltimore Catechism, number two. And here on uh, page 59, down at the bottom, you have that. I can't read it from my little viewfinder there. It says, The Holy Spirit, symbolized by a dove, comes from the Father and the Son, like love from the heart. He is the mutual love of the Father and the Son. Mutual love of the Father and the Son. Hmm. That's going to be important later. Now, this one here is, you know, it's a nicer addition, so I definitely want to take better care of that. Excuse me. Uh, turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 2. Let's look at do a little brief study of what marriage is in the Bible and why it's so absurd to try and use this thing of, well, see, the Father and the Son, they're two separate people, but they both share the, the title God. And, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of issues there. We're, I'm going to show you a bunch of proof today. going to be definitely a lot more detailed study. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 through 25. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an helpmeet for him. Okay, let's 
we're using this here to prove man and wife coming together and their one flesh. This is similar to God the Father and God the Son, using their terminology. Um, and so, you know, you can see it there. Oh, okay, really? So it's not good that the Father should dwell alone? He needed to make a helpmate for himself in the person of Jesus Christ? That's a little odd. Verse 19. Again, you know, you just say, well, we don't believe, we don't teach. Why are you using that as an analogy? Why are you using that to try and prove your pagan trinity concept? Husband and wife coming together as one flesh, and that's the same as the Father and the Son together as one flesh. Verse 19. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he um, a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. How in the world would you even try to use this to prove two separate people in the Godhead and the Holy Spirit's kind of the third one? We'll see how he get, comes into this whole thing here in just a little while. But two separate people in the Godhead. Uh, well, if you're trying to teach, use that to teach the, the this Trinity thing, two separate people, and yet they're one God, man and woman, and yet one flesh, um, then you have to teach that Jesus came out of God. Weird. Uh, verse 24, therefore, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So you say, there we see it. There we see it. They're one flesh. Um, yes, but what makes them one flesh? Just living together? Uh, what's the cleaving all about? Uh, sexual intimacy. I'm going to show you that here as we continue. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Um, did you know that that's still the case today? You should be ashamed of yourself if you're naked out in public, which they would have been out in public back then. There wasn't really anybody else to see them. But, you know, the point is, uh, there was nothing wrong with the two of them being naked together. There was no shame felt there. Same thing between a husband and a wife. There's no shame felt when they're both naked. At least there shouldn't be, unless there's something really wrong with the marriage. Okay? <laughs> If you're ashamed to be seen without your clothes on by your, you know, husband or wife or something, that's that's a problem. Okay, you, you might want to get that checked out or something, you know. But uh, say, what's the New Testament tie-in? Well, let's go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, and we're going to be looking at other stuff too in the Pauline epistles. I know I got a lot of hyper dispensational, mentally insane people that watch me. And they're probably screaming and frothing at the mouth right now. But we'll get to the Pauline epistles. Just, you know, rest a little bit there, okay? You know, don't get your blood pressure up above that level of a corpse, you know. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. First part there. Marriage is undefiled, or excuse me, honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. What does that mean? The man and his wife are both naked, and they were not ashamed. All right? Go to the Pauline Epistles, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And we'll see instruction here for Christians about marriage. Verses 1 through 5. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication. Hmm. Let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. All right? The sexual intimacy of a marriage. That's what makes it a marriage. 
a man and a woman living together and having no sexual contact, they're not married. Okay? So again, what kind of a weird mind would try to come up with a thing of using marriage, a husband and a wife coming together in sexual intimacy in a bed and say, uh, and, and they become one flesh as a result of that, and say, oh, you know, well, see, we can, we can prove that God the Father and God the Son, nowhere in Scripture, you know, nowhere in the Bible say God the Son, we can prove that they're one flesh because it's like a marriage. And I'm going to show you that this is literally what is taught, that they're literally saying it's a level of intimacy, and there's kissing going on between the Father and the Son. I kid you not. And there's some very deep impl implications here, right? Which we'll be getting into. You say, but, but this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. I'm, you, you, marriage and, and things, and, and, and you're trying to make it into the sexual thing and, and whatever else. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15 through 16. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. Say, so, oh, marriage is, is about some kind of special, you know, vows that you take away. No, uh, marriage is not just, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Marriage is a man and a woman coming together and having a sexual relationship. That's what makes them one flesh. We just read it right here. You're going to have a good time. You're going to go out and, and on the town and whatever else, and there's a harlot standing on the street corner, and she says, hey, for X amount of money, we can kind of go back to my place or whatever else. Oh, yeah, let's do that. And you go into the harlot, you just became one flesh with her. Essentially the same as marriage, but it's called in the Bible fornication. You're yoking yourself up. Sexual union is what makes people one flesh. Why in the world would anybody who calls themselves a Bible-believing Christian try to take something that's completely separate from the Godhead? Nowhere is there any kind of a thing saying that the father is married to the son or anywhere even close to that. The father's going to marry the son or something like this. The son has the bride of Christ, symbolized as a woman in Revelation chapter 19. Where does, the, where does this level of perversity come up with? And I thought, well, it's just, like I said earlier, I said I, I, I thought it's just a, some kind of a desperate attempt of Trinitarians to try and prove how you can have two separate people and yet... They're one, and that's all the farther it went. It was just, it's just Bible believers that are just grasping at straws to try and prove their Trinity thing. Uh, no, it isn't actually. It is taught by Roman Catholics, and I'm going to show you the deeper implication. It's really setting you up here to look forward to that. I'm going to show you that to, that, or that to you here as we continue. Uh, let me put my Bible over here. I just find it appalling. Uh, you know, I just want to answer this, another little attack that's come against me. Um, and, you know, I'm probably going to have to make a separate video because people don't, don't have the attention span, you know, Trinitarians especially, to watch a long study and whatever else. They can't handle much scripture. And, uh, but let me just say this, okay, because people will say, well, you use words like church age, premillennial, millennial kingdom, whatever else, uh, and, and I already kind of addressed this with the thing of pre-trib rapture. Um, that's all the farther it has to go. I can prove the pre-trib rapture and not use that term from Scripture. I can prove the pre-millennial coming of Jesus Christ and the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. I can prove the church age from Scripture and say, I don't even need to use that term. But you cannot prove the Trinity without using the terms of the Trinity. Trinity, Trinitarian, essence, unity, okay, in terms of unity between Father and Son, God the Son, God the Spirit, three persons. You have to use added terms to the Scriptures to prove the Trinity, okay? So, no, it's not the same thing. See, again, Trinitarians come up with so many little desperate ar arguments, so many little things that they try to, to, to use to go against the, uh, what, a, what the Bible teaches. It's disgusting. But what we're going to do here is we're going to play uh, 
couple of videos and I'm going to show you where exactly this whole uh, perverted thing of father and son, it's, it's as if they're married. And I'm going to show you what it's leading to and what it already is, you know, the philosophy behind. Um, I'll just tell you right now, Revelation chapter 17 um, identifies Roman Catholicism as, you know, Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. If there's something wicked and horrible and sinful and evil, especially with sex perversion, you can trace it right back to the Vatican every single time. And you know, people, oh, you're so paranoid. Oh, I'm so paranoid as just thousands upon thousands of people are coming out and saying, yeah, I was molested as a child in the Catholic convent. I was molested as a child in the Catholic orphanage. I went to Catholic parochial schools, molested there by my priest and my nun. And it, 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 But I'm paranoid, you know? It's just all over the media for years and years and years and years and years, children coming out saying we've been molested by the Catholic Church. And yet I come out and I say something about it, and all, then there's paranoid. He thinks the Catholics are behind everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sure. You bunch of stupid papists. But uh, let's, let's watch some of this stuff, and I'm going to show you where this teaching came from and why no Bible believer should be taken seriously. You know, why no one should be take someone serious that calls themselves a King James Bible believer that uses this, well, it's like a married couple and their unity, their one flesh. Uh, you know, let me show you. Stay with the idea image for a second. So I stand before a mirror, and the mirror produces a rather remarkable image of me. But it's an image in the most superficial way. It's a two-dimensional reproduction of the physical appearance of my body, right? What's in the mirror doesn't have any mind or will or, or passion or personality. It's just, a, it's just an image of my physical surface. But now consider God the supreme reality. The Father can produce an image that is perfect, a perfect reproduction of his own being. Okay, let me stop there for a minute. A perfect re reproduction of himself. He can produce a perfect reproduction. Oh, so then you're basically saying that God created Jesus. He produced a perfect, you know, representation. And, and these video clips I'm showing, I took them out of the original and I did not alter them or put any kind of uh, photo, anything in there or whatever else. I just put a little USC section 107 fair use clause thing. I put that on the video. You can see it's kind of a watermark in the upper corner. That's all I did. I did not add any of these photos. These are the photos that they chose. And you're going to see this guy saying, this Bishop Barron, his name is, and you're going to see him saying that the Father and the Son are perfect mirror images of each other, and he's showing pictures of an old man as the Father and a young man, Jesus. Uh, that's not a perfect image. <laughs> Let's continue. Possessing the mind, will, personality, freedom, power, love, simplicity of the Father. So indeed, we say in that same creed that the Son is God from God, light from light, true God from true God. The Son is an utterly perfect imago, image of the Father. We say indeed, consubstantial with the Father, one in being. Okay? Now, from all eternity, the Father looks at the Son. The Son looks back at the Father. What do they see? Each sees the utter perfection, beauty, goodness, and truth of the other. Okay, uh, i got to stop it there again. Each sees the utter perfection and beauty of each other. You know, uh, then why are you showing pa paintings? I mean, these are the paintings that they showed. You can look at the original video. You're showing two different looking, you know, men, if you want to call them that. Two different looking men, and yet they're utter perfect copies of each other. But here's where it gets sick. Let's continue. And so they naturally, necessarily, automatically fall in love with each other. To use Fulton Sheen's beautiful phrase, they, they sigh their love for each other. That sigh, that holy breath, we call the spiritus Sanctus, the Holy Breath, the Holy Spirit. God 
is a communio, a communion, a family of image making and communication. Yikes. Okay, now let's think about this, the deeper meaning behind all this. What do we have running rife through the system of Roman Catholicism? We have priests that like to rape little boys. Now, what is a priest called in Roman Catholicism? Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. And what does the priest answer back? Make your confession, my son. Hmm. You mean to tell me that uh, a priest would actually believe that he as a father could fall in love with a son? And that the love between them would be the Holy Spirit manifested? You say, oh, you're stretching things. Really? You mean to tell me that this epidemic that's going on, and it's, you know, I don't even know what you want to call it, an epidemic, pandemic, I mean, some catastrophe, nuclear meltdown, whatever you want to call the thing, the, the, the rape level of these pervert, disgusting priests. I mean, if you don't get, if your blood doesn't boil, when you hear the story of these Catholic priests doing this, you're not saved. It's just as simple as that. If you don't get really, really angry about hearing these priests, the way that they rape these children and seeing these priests putting their hands on these little children and things, uh, you're not saved. You don't have the Holy Spirit of God in you. Okay? I'll be right back. Got to answer the phone. All right, I'm back. Telemarketer. You got to wonder. I think the devil uses telemarketers or something, you know. It's right in the middle of a sermon. But my point I'm trying to make is, if you think about this thing, and like I was saying, you know, if you have no emotional anger that comes out of you, righteous indignation, when you hear that priests are raping little children, um, you're not saved. You don't have the Holy Spirit of God in you. I can firmly say that without any kind of doubt or any, well, maybe, no, no, no. You will hate what these Catholic priests are doing. So when you see a system where these priests are saying something, and again, this, this has no basis at all in Scripture. No basis at all where it says that the father, he looks at the son in love and they love one another and there's this, this love and, th and that creates the Holy Spirit, you know. And you're going to see it gets even worse. It gets even worse with what these people are teaching. All right, let's watch the next clip. Jesus is saying that he is subordinate to the father. That is to say, uh, he, the father is greater in office, not in his nature. Here's how I illustrate this with Jehovah's Witnesses. In biblical marriage, which the Jehovah's Witness agrees with, the husband and wife have different roles. Not only that, but the husband has a greater role than the wife. After all, he's the head of the family. This might be controversial to the secular society, but it isn't to a Jehovah's Witnesses. So in one sense, the husband is greater than the wife, However, in another sense, husbands and wives are equal because they share a human nature. They are equal in nature, but unequal in their roles. The marriage relationship is a dim reflection of God's being. The co-eternal, co-equal persons of the Trinity are one in their divine nature. In addition, this makes sense of all of Scripture. And so we can take verses like John 14, 28, the Father is greater than I, and verses like John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. A Trinitarian view can make sense of all of these verses taken together. I could do some imitation stuff there, but I'll let you do that. Uh, okay, he just called Jesus a woman, essentially. Jesus is, is lesser. When he says, my father is greater than I, well, uh, a soul is greater than a body of flesh. Yes. Okay. Uh, Jesus Christ, if again, if you're new to this whole thing, let me explain how the Godhead is made up. Jesus Christ is the body of the Godhead. The father is the soul. The Holy Ghost is the spirit. These three are one. He's one being walking around. He's not God in three different modes or something like modalism teaches. He's not three different separate people that all claim the title of God or whatever. He's one being, one 
man. But he has a body, a soul, and a spirit. Man is made in the image of God. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. All right? It's it's simple to understand that. Now there are difficulties of how does it, you know, that he gets up to heaven and the body and the soul are separate and things and and what yeah, there's a bunch of stuff there that you say, "Oh, that's interesting." And of course, I can prove the same thing about us, you know, which I've talked about in other studies. But here's the point. They are clearly using, I mean, you saw a lot of the same language as the bishop, Catholic bishop right before, and this guy's a professing, you know, Christian Protestant or something, you know. And yet you have King James Bible believers that would say, yeah, I don't agree with either one of those two. And yet you're using the same arguments. And I'm going to show you a big name uh, King James only guy here in a little bit that uses the same argument as the Catholics. But let's continue. And here's what's really cool, too. This is amazing. And the Word was with God. Notice the distinction there. The word in the Greek is this, proston theon, and it means this, face to face, face to face toward God. Jesus existed from all eternity. Jesus was in face to face communion with the Father. Intimate relationship, intimacy, like a husband and wife get together, and what are they? Face to face intimacy. We'll see God face to face. There's intimacy there. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was face to face with the Father. He was in intimate relationship with the Father from all eternity. And the Word was God. Okay, excuse me. I'm, I'm almost about ready to retch. I mean, oh my word. If you don't know who that was, that was Jeff Durbin, a uh, little James White buddy, a tattooed little fruitcake and whatever else. And, I, you know, I'm not ripping on people. I had tattoos back before they got saved. He gets them after he's uh, <clears throat> saved, yeah. <laughs> and just, I had, I think I'm going to get rewards at the judgment seat of Christ for enduring watching that whole thing till I got to, it was 42 minutes in or something of his little message thing that he did. It was horrible. I mean, just, ugh, it's so bad to listen to this guy. Ugh. You know, just, just like some caffeinated, caffeinated uh, high school teenage you know, cheerleader or something. I mean, it's, oh, oh. but you know, intimacy, the word, the word there, it's not with, it's, you know, quote some Greek thing. And, and it makes you think that, that there's just one, you know, thing there. And it was kind of poorly translated where it says the word was with God. You know, it's a deeper meaning. Oh, the Greek nugget. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, kind of like a horse apple. And, uh, you know, and this Greek, you know, it means face to face. Like when a man is intimate with his wife, what are you saying about the Father and the Son and their relationship? What are you saying? It's not the Holy Spirit of God. You aren't going to find that teaching anywhere at all in the Scriptures. Nowhere. Does it say that there's an intimate relationship between the Father and the Son? You know? These people are disgusting. They're sick in the head. But they'll do whatever they have to do to prove that doctrine. You've got to get that Trinity doctrine in there. you got to get it in there. There's three separate people up there all claiming to be God. Hmm. Let's continue. Next, we're going to get a, a real, you know, King James Bible believing. Yeah. One of the biggest frauds ever. Hell bound or not hell bound. He's in hell right now, burning and frying. All right. Let's watch. And by the way, that's one reason why you couldn't talk me to even having one second's patience with these oneness people that don't believe in Trinity. Let me tell you the main, the, one of the great proofs there's a trinity. God is love. And love must have an object. And if in the beginning there was only God, which there was, if there was only one person in the Godhead, then God did not need to be loved because there was no object of the love of God. One of the great proofs of the journey where it says God is love. And back yonder, in eternity past, the God and the Father loved the Son. Get this now. He loved His Son. And He loved the Holy Spirit. The Bible speaks about the love of the Spirit. And the Son loved the Spirit. And the Son loved the Father. And the Spirit 
loved the Father, and the Holy Spirit loved the Son. And all of those eternities and eons, there was this love, deity, loving deity, and deity, loving deity, and God the Father, loving God the Son, and God the Father, loving God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son, loving God the Father, and God the a son, loving God the Holy Spirit, and God the Holy Spirit, loving God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit, loving God the Son. Can you imagine the quality of that love? Yeah. Okay, if you don't know who that is, that's Jack Hiles. Uh, one of the biggest fraudster hucksters ever. Um, I have studies on him. You can watch the guy. I mean, he's, he's just a lying con artist. Um, fornicating with his deacon's wife. I mean, just perversion, perversion, perversion. Uh, almost like the Catholic Church. Hmm, yeah. Um, you know, they didn't, they didn't mess with boys. Well, so actually, his one guy did. His one soul winner you know, took little boys out on a camping trip and was raping them and actually went to prison because of it. And while in prison, Jack Hiles gives his wife a, a memorial plaque or something saying how great a, a soul winner his, her husband was. The guy that's in prison for molesting children. You know, so yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I take that back. They did molest children with the whole Hiles Anderson cult. But they went after teenage girls a lot too. So, you know, I was trying to give them a little bit of leeway there. But uh, I didn't, again, that's the clip the way it was. I didn't make it blue like that or whatever else. I put the flames in the background and, and whatever just to show these are all hellbound people. But, uh, I mean, you heard it. Now, why would Jack Hiles use the same argument as a Roman Catholic priest? Bishop, excuse me. And I'm going to show you a Roman Catholic, an actual Roman Catholic priest in a Catholic church using the same argument here as the last final clip. But you see, here's the whole thing. One thing you're going to learn as a Christian is uh, lost people, their number one goal in life is to find a hypocrite bigger than they themselves are so they can hide behind them. They want to get a scapegoat. Why well, am I, hey, I might be bad, but I'm not like... How many times I've heard that witnessing to people? Are you going to go to heaven when you die? Oh, well, I don't know. I think I might. Uh, well, have you done these sins? Well, I'm not... I haven't killed anybody. I haven't... Done, they're trying to find somebody else to put the blame on. It's funny because if they just come to Jesus Christ as a sinner, you can put your blame for your sinful life on him and say, he'll take the payment for what I've done, my, my messed up life that I've had. But then you have to admit to you being guilty, you know, and see, that's, that doesn't work for them. So, you know, they'll just try to find somebody else and say, well, we're all just kind of sinners down here. And that's the whole key to this thing. You see, with the Trinity, you can make it three separate people, all right? And there's this kind of a, I don't want to get into too much here, but there's kind of this relationship between the Father and the Son, and they produce the love that they produce is the Holy Spirit. And you're going to hear the Catholic priest next actually saying that, yeah, it's like husband and wife, and the love that they produce is like a child. And that's the reflection of Father, Son, and they produce love and produce the Holy Spirit. I kid you not. And he goes to, so far as to say, I mean, Dirk Ben there, he said it's intimacy like between a, a wife and a husband, you know, their faces are together. When are your faces together? I mean, sorry to be graphic here, but when is a husband and wife's face together in intimacy, in the marriage bed? Okay. What's he trying to say about the father and the son in this trinity? But you see, if you can have a system where there's some sinful stuff and, and think, why is Catholicism so, so uh, popular? Because half the people that are going there know that the priest is doing wicked things. And they say, hey, if he's doing that, well, I can get away with, you see? They found their big hypocrite that they can hide behind. Well, I might have some my issues, but what about them? You see? And if in your satanic, deluded mind, you can actually make God out to be somewhat of a sinner too. Well, hey, who's he to judge me? That's what it's all about. That's what this whole Trinity thing is all about. You have to add to the scriptures to teach it, number one. Number two, you'll use these horrible satanic lies comparing the father and the son's relationship to a man and a woman, or you know, a man and his wife, say it that way. 
You'd have to say something so vile and so blasphemous. Say, well, we're just trying to show that, you know, two people can be one flesh. They're one flesh because of sexual union. Why on earth would you say that about the Father and the Son? Unless you have a very vile, satanic spirit within you. You're disgusting. And you call yourself a King James Bible believer and use an argument like that that's being used by Catholic devils that like to rape little children. And a, a wicked pervert, Baptist pervert like Jack Hiles. One more video. And the third person of the Holy Trinity is the Holy Spirit, who is co-eternal with the Father and the Son, who is of the same substance and same essence and same nature of the Father and the Son. And he is known as the mutual love of the Father and the Son. The Son is generated by way of the intellect. That is why Jesus is sometimes called the wisdom of God. Whereas the Holy Spirit proceeds by way of the will. That is why he is called love. Saint Bernard of Clairvaux once called the Holy Spirit the kiss of God. He once said this, if, as is properly understood, the Father is he who kisses, the Son he who is kissed, then it cannot be wrong to see in the kiss the Holy Spirit, for he is the imperturbable peace of the Father and the Son their unshakable bond, their undivided love, their indivisible unity. Take the guy out back and beat him to death. How dare you say something like that? How foul, how disgusting, especially with there's so many perverts, so many just pedophile priests all the time raping children and he has the nerve to say something like that. Their time's coming. Their time's coming. And we're going to be up in heaven when Mystery Babylon is destroyed. We're going to be up in heaven throwing a party. Having a great time. Can't wait for that. You know, I can't wait to see the Roman Catholic Church just destroyed, just smashed. Just destroyed. Can't wait for it. But you notice there again, the Father he who kisses, the Son, he who is kissed, and the Holy Spirit is the love between the two. And it, it, there's nothing wrong with that. We're, we can see this, this undying love between the Father and the Son. Yeah. And then you take it as, well, I'm a priest, I'm the Father, and this young boy is, this, is my Son. Yes, my Son. I forgive your sins, my Son. Oh, let's go in here, back in here to my quarters, and we're going to have... Uh, some certain things happen and it's okay it's okay because it's my as the father kisses the son and gives love so too i am giving you the love of the holy the holy spirit like the <laughs> devil's just coming out of the guy the holy spirit the, the love comes between the two and 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 you know from their union it is Satanic ritual abuse, yeah, that's there. But there's a high level of Satanism here that's going on. All right? It just disgusts me. But let's continue with a little bit more of this Satanic imp here. And you'll see him compare it to marriage between a man and a woman. Now that we know a little bit more about who God is... Now we could see what God has done for us and what he is doing for us in light of who he is. And when we do that, we could see the bigger and fuller picture of God's divine plan for us. For example, in creation, that is what God does. 
when God creates man in the book of Genesis, God says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, referring to who he is. And God creates Adam and Eve, and he tells them, be fruitful and multiply. They become one flesh, and as a result, becomes another person, a third person in the picture. Thus, they are to image and mirror, if you will, who God is. This is God's divine plan for us. He creates so that we could reflect who he is. That's the bigger picture, if you will, of God's plan for us. So there you have it. Right there. Kind of funny too, you know, uh, the, the, the man and the woman coming together and they, they, their love and they produce it. It's, it's showing the image of the Trinity, you know, in heaven and, and whatever. <clears throat> yeah, spoken by a celibate priest. Figure that one out, you know. Brilliant, brilliant people here. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So, <clears throat> shut my computer down here. Absolutely sickening. Absolutely sickening. And yet you have people that say, I'm a King James Bible believing Christian. Uh, you know, I believe the King James Bible from cover to cover. And uh, if I want to prove this Trinity thing, I'll just, I'll keep lying and saying, it's right in there. It's in there. It's right there. It's the Trinity is Bible doctrine. The Bible teaches the Trinity. How dare you reject the Trinity? If any man rejects the Trinity, he's a heretic. Okay, you papist. And you're yoking up, when you use these types of arguments, you're yoking up with Catholic priests. They're saying things that are vile and blasphemous, and maybe you didn't mean it. If you're a Bible-believing whatever, maybe you didn't mean it the way that these people are meaning it. Maybe you wouldn't take it as far. But it's the Holy. It's not the Holy Spirit. Say it this. It's not the Holy Spirit of God that's leading you to compare the Father and the Son's relationship with a man and a woman, and sexual unity, that makes them one flesh. That's not the Holy Spirit of God. You've gotten it from someplace else. It's not from the Bible. The Holy Spirit didn't show it to you. Where you getting it from? You're getting it from devil spirits. If you're saved, and I say a big if to those of you out there that claim to be Bible believers and use this wicked argument, if you're saved, you are way out of fellowship with the Lord. Seriously out of fellowship with the Lord. But I would check your salvation and check and see if you're legitimate, if you would utter such vile things about the Lord Jesus Christ and, his, and the Father there. I mean, it's, it's just disgusting. The Trinity issue... It's not some kind of a thing of, well, it's semantics, it's word games, it's... It, listen to me. The Trinity is not in the Bible, okay? And you can't say, well, yes, but, the, you know, I can prove it. The word Trinity is not there, but I can prove it. You can't prove it if your life depended on it. All the time. There's the God in three persons. No scripture. God the Son. No scripture. God the Holy Spirit. No scripture. Divine essence. No scripture. One in unity. No, no scripture. No scripture for any of this whole system. You say, well, you're the premillennial coming. Okay, we won't call it the premillennial coming. But I can show you that there's a thousand years where Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign in Revelation chapter 20. I can show it to you. Millennial means 1,000. Okay? <laughs> okay, don't abandon the term millennial kingdom because it's not in scripture. But I can show you that Jesus rules and reigns for a thousand years on the earth. Well, premillennials, I can show you he comes down at the beginning and he doesn't go back up. He rules and reigns. They will come to Jerusalem and see the great king, the city of the great king, Matthew chapter 5. I can prove all that stuff. Pre-trib rapture is not in scripture. Okay, but I can show you the catching up before the time of Jacob's trouble. But you can't show me the Trinity unless you use these added satanic words. These added words that the Catholic Church came up with and the importance of this whole thing to the Catholic Church. It is their primary doctrine. Ask yourself why. Because is, is it the motivation, number one, it's the motivation for perverted sexual relationships between the Father and the Son. And they say, we're just trying to have the love of the Holy Spirit. What do you think's coming next, by the way? Sex perversion. 
It gets worse and worse and worse. Now we have gay marriage being accepted all over the world and things, and the Pope has even come out and saying, well, you know, maybe we can kind of accept this, and this guy comes out and he's a sodomite and whatever, and, and I'm sorry that our, the church is, you know, all that stuff. Uh, the, the church is going to go pink eventually or rainbow, whatever you want to say. Um, but what comes after that? What comes after it? See, they overthrew the anti-miscegenation laws years ago, 1960s. Two Jesuit lawyers here in America. Cohen and I, forget, I always forget the other guy's name. Two Jesuit lawyers. Okay, one from Georgetown. I forget the other, other guy. It might have been Georgetown as well. But two Jesuits overthrew the anti-miscegenation laws. So interracial marriages can happen now. They're now legal. And then years go by and, oh no, sodomy laws. Let's overthrow those. And now sodomites can get married nationally. What comes next? Oh, well, the uh, transgender thing in the bathrooms. Well, that's kid stuff. Okay? It's wicked. Wicked. Definitely. But what's the real danger? When adults start to go after children. That's the real danger. That's the real horrible thing. How are they going to justify it? Well, hey, the father and the son. There's an intimate relationship there. There's intimacy face to face because I found a Greek word that I can use and twist and things and, and make it face to face. <laughs> the word is not with God anymore. It's the word is face to face with God. Intimacy. Dirty, filthy perverts is what you people are out there that would use this argument. The Bible clearly teaches that a man and a woman come together. They cleave to each other. It's the marriage bed and that makes them one flesh. In so much that if you go join your body to a harlot, you become one flesh with her. It's sexual union. Why on earth would you use that about the father and the son? Unless you're a covert papist, or unless you've gotten these lies from the papist, and you've departed from the Holy Spirit of God, not, you're not even listening to him anymore. Second reason why the Trinity is so important to the Roman Catholic Church. Because the Bible says in the book of Revelation that there's going to be a Trinity in the future. False prophet. Beast and Satan. Three separate people. Yes, there will be a trinity on the earth claiming to be God. The trinity is very, very important to the devil. Extremely important to the devil. So, that's going to be it for this study. If you people out there, you wicked pagans out there, think that I'm going to quit kicking the trinity issue... Um, nope. The Lord keeps giving us more and more stuff. Kicking this whole thing. And I'm going to be coming out and I'm going to be fighting it harder than ever. Because I realize just how extremely satanic the whole thing is. I mean, we're dealing with the very nature of God here. And you know, and oh, well, you're, you're a wicked idolater if you don't believe in the Trinity. Um, no, actually, it's quite the opposite. You liars out there try to make that claim. Quite the opposite. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ is wholly, completely God, then you are the idolater. In Him, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, in Him, speaking about Christ, verse 8, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. There's only one God. In Isaiah 9, 6, we hear a lot of time right now at this time of the year, the Christmas season, and we hear the, the what is it, uh, the the... Oh, is it handles Messiah or whatever else? And it's and they're they're singing unto us a child is born, a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Do you believe it or don't you? Well, we'll have to make two fathers, or maybe it's just not talking about. To, and you have to mess with the verse. A child is born. A son is given, and his name is the Everlasting Father. And they don't have some kind of weird, perverse union like a man and a woman do. You might as well just get it figured out, you stupid people out there that hate this ministry. Um, I'm going to fight. Your only hope is that I get killed sometime or that the Lord catches me up. That's your only hope. Because I'm not going to quit. 
I don't care what you do, what you say, whatever. I'm not quitting because I care about the little children out there that are getting sodomized and raped by these priests. I hate Roman Catholicism with every fiber of my being and I will not stop exposing its wickedness until the Lord catches me up or lets me die. That's it. Thank you for watching.